Fulton J. Sheen, God and the Intelligence Continuation of Chapter 10 The Non-Intellectual Approach to God Hypothesis and Fiction, or Owls and Ob What, then, is to be thought of the theory according to which God is the most reasonable and probable hypothesis? One cannot but admire the sincerity and the good intention with which Sir Henry Jones and others have set about the task of reconstituting some belief in God. But the intention of the writer must not blind us to those features which render a faith that inquires an erroneous substitution for the common-sense notion. First, in answer to the question, what is the origin of the hypothesis? This author writes, the idea of God comes as a possible or probable and convincing explanation of the universe and of man's life and destiny. We approach the facts of life with preconception, favorable or unfavorable, of the existence of God, which is the result not so much of external observation as of reflection upon our own nature and needs. These preoccupations are the result of gifts that come to man by inheritance as potencies in his very structure at birth. The treasure of slowly accumulated traditions and habits of living into which he enters little by little, day by day, as a member of society. Here there is a confusion of the origin of hypothesis and the origin of first principles. Such a knowledge of God is really the confused knowledge of scholastics. It is true that we do approach the facts of life with a certain preoccupation, which is the result of potencies in our structure of, at birth, which are in perfect accordance with our nature and our needs. But what are these but the knowledge of first principles, which are naturally known and in demonstrable, which lie in the potency in the soul and flesh into the act of knowledge once the terms become known. They are the seeds of all consequent knowledge. These principles belong to our nature from a certain preconception. If you will, our needs, our end, and our destiny, in virtue of them, man has a natural inclination to know the truth of God. They are the first movers of our intellectual life, and their natural term is the knowledge and love of God. But they are far from being hypothesis. They are not conditional. They are not tentative explanations of things. They are necessary and absolute. They admit of no exception. As they admit of no demonstration... They are perceived by an intuition once the terms are understood. This point has been insisted on in a previous chapter, and it suffices here to recall it. Sir Henry Jones has vaguely seen that some movement is necessary at the beginning and throughout the whole of our intellectual life, but he has mistaken these intellectual principles for mere accumulated traditions and habits of living. He has divined their origin in saying they are born from the intercourse of mind and objects, but he errs in calling them mere subjects of proof. Had he throughout, had he thoroughly seen the necessary contained in first principles of both the speculative and the practical intellect, he never would have descended into hypothesis in his treatment of God as he never would have set up out of world process the kind of God he actually pos proposed. Then his foundations of knowledge, example on page 346, instead of being hypothesis would have been necessities. Furthermore, it would have been well at the outside of any work which treats God as a hypothesis, to inquire the meaning of the very term hypothesis and its conditions. Why is an hypothesis possible? It is not for a formal and a material reason. 
First, the failure of the mind to attach a given judgment about things or a group of facts to some necessary and certain principle. For example, the dream is the disguised realization of an unfulfilled desire. This judgment has an evident connection with a certain fixed and necessary principle, and consequently has that element of possibility about it, which makes it apt to be an hypothesis. The second reason for an hypothesis is the mutuability and the potency of material things. The material principle in reality is determinable and precisely because it is infinitely determinable, there is a possibility of an infinity of individuals in the same genus and a possibility of mul- of multiplied tests in the same genus. The more you have of matter, the more you have of the indefinite. The first element represents the formal aspect of hypothesis and the second the material. One is on relation to knowledge and the other is relation to matter. But God, as the object of knowledge, falls under neither of these elements. He does not fall under the first because the proof for his existence has immediate connection with the necessary principle of the mind, e.g., the principle of identity. He does not fall under the second because he is not matter. Any test made on matter will be about our our subjective attitude towards God. It will in no way be a test about his objective existence. Matter does not make him intelligible. Rather, he makes matter intelligible. The very conditions, then, which render a hypothesis possible, make it at the same time impossible to apply it to God. God, the hypothesis, are traveling in opposite directions, and it is impossible that one should ever fall under the other. And what is true of hypothesis in this matter is true of Professor V. Hangers, Owls, and Ob. It may now be asked, why have the philosophers seen fit to throw God into experience to test him as any other scientific hypothesis. In this matter, it is important to get to the foundation of things. What is the basis of the distinction of higher science? Sir Henry Jones has rightly insisted on the fact that the matter of the system of knowledge determines the method of inquiry. The method which can be fruitful employed depends upon the aspect of reality, or the matter which is investigated. In other words, science vary according to the abstraction brought to bear upon them. Every science has its particular point of view and purpose. This is perfectly good. Aristotelianism. Now is the degree of abstraction determined the science, and there are three supreme grades of abstraction. It follows that there will be three supreme sciences. The first degree of abstraction is that of quantity in movement, which gives the science of physics. The second degree of abstraction is from movement. The object considered are im. Mobilia, which though not separated from the matter according to being, are separated according to reason. This gives the science of mathematics. These two abstractions Sir Henry recognizes, but unfortunately recognizes them as ultimate. There is, however, yet another degree of abstraction, which abstracts from all formal quality and quantity and existence, except being. And this most honorable science is concerned with the most honorable genus of beings in which are contained divine things. Sir Henry stops with the second degree of abstraction. Instead of mounting up to the third, where he would find even a greater necessity than in physics or mathematics, he descends into the empirical order, wherein he finds a proof of necessity. Wherever there is systematic coherence and external interdependence, in this precisely consists the fallacy. 
The philosophy of God's existence belongs to the third degree of abstraction. He is being. Now, if the degree of abstraction determines the method, and God is discovered and treated by the third degree of abstraction, which is metaphysical, it follows that he will not be studied by a method dependent on psychological state. God is not tested in the spiritual laboratory of the universe. God will forever remain outside the realm of experience as experience. Just as the truth of the multiplication table will remain outside Freudian interpretation of dreams. To say that God must be tested like the test of an invention and in no way like the aug argument for or against the theory, page 86, is to miss the whole point at issue. Why can an invention be tested by the way it works? Because both in its nature and in its mode of operation, it is entirely in the order of experiment. But God is not in the order of experiment, either in his nature or in his mode of operation. What makes the test possible for an invention is the very thing that makes it impossible with God. God is shown to be by the intellectual and not by the empirical order. He must therefore be the object of intellectual and not empirical investigation. Furthermore, before an invention can be tested, it must exist. So too, before God can be tested, he must exist. Experiences and tests then can bear only upon his utility for us and not upon his existence. Throughout the whole philosophy of faith or hypothesis, there is this fundamental confusion between the existence of a thing and its utility. Sir Henry Jones says that the denial of God's existence will have far-reaching consequences which are recognized as too insane to be entertained. This indeed is true, for God cannot be denied without ultimately denying the principle of contradiction. To do this argues insanity, if you will, but it is the insanity not of an empirical, experimental world, but of a world of necessary truths. Our knowledge of God comes from experience, but the reason of our ad adhesion is not experience alone. In a word, the whole philosophy of hypothesis falls into a vicious circle. On the one hand, it says that principles must be tested by experience, and at the same time, it tests experience by principles. The fact, the facts have no value unless considered in the light of the general ideas of being, cause, and effect, finality, reason of being, and the like. They have no value except in virtue of principle. The only way out of the vicious circle is to admit with genuine intellectualist philosophy that we adhere to certain principles not only because of the testimony of experience but by reason of their intellectual content. The modern philosophy of faith and the hypothesis reveals a sincerity of intention among its adherents, as it is also reveals the chaos among modern minds which results from the rejection of intelligence. The fallacy of the German school is that it forgets that before we can have belief in God, we must have a reason for that belief. Before we can live as if God existed, we must have a reason for this hypothesis of his existence. What is the foundation of the supposition, or the fiction, as the German school calls it, if it is not something intellectual? Fiction proceeds as if the thing existed. In other words, it is a kind of mental hyp hypnotism by which we make the imaginary real. The philosophy of the Al's Alb does not sound so bad when it, kept, when it keeps to Kantian terms, but bring it down to the field of reality without changing its principles and it refutes itself. Living as if we had our three meals a day will never fill an empty stomach. Living as if we were rich will soon 
drive us into the poorhouse, living as if there was a God will never give us God. It may eventually affect our mental attitude, as we have already pointed out. But if God is no more than this mental attitude, then there is no God but ourselves. Hypothesis and fictions have their place, but their place is not in the problem of God. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Reason does not warrant, nor does prudence dictate are abandoning genuine intellectual principles for mere suppositions. 3. Reflex intellectual knowledge is essential in the development or religious experience. Modern philosophy has not gone to the extreme of denying every intellectual development of religious experience. Many writers agree that some elaboration of reflection is necessary to bring such immediate knowledge to greater conceptual clearness. We must, in words of Professor Hornell, make plain what, in a sense, is there and possessed by us all the time. But what part does the intelligence play? Is the building out performed by the intellect? Accidental and secondary? The answer to the question is shown by one general opposition to all dogma. The reflective element is merely a surface exhibition, a sort of philosophical luxury. Scholastic thought, on the contrary, regards it as an essential, an integral part of our knowledge of God. The reason is that to know God by a confused knowledge is not to know him as distinct from other objects of knowledge. Knowledge properly so called is not confused, rather it is distinct. That God is involved in every act of knowledge is true, but he is involved only implicitly. The confused notion of being, for example, which the intelligence has in its ontological infancy, is by no means identical with God. God is implicitly in every desire and in all love, but only in his likeness and not in his essence. If we should restrict our desires always to confuse knowledge without making them reflexly definite, they would be in vain, hence the necessity of drawing them out of of their confused state, simply because we have a natural desire to such happiness. We are not dispensed from seeking, from seeking God by intellectual investigation. The same may be said for the instinct of God of which Professor Alexander speaks. Instinct for food is for food in general, not for caviar. The particular determination of the instinct functions through sense knowledge. So too, simply because we have an instinct for God in the above defined sense, it does not follow that the undetermined pabulum which satisfies our soul's hunger is God. In what the particular determination consists, that is whether it be the virtue or knowledge or pleasure or anything of the kind nature has not determined. To call any of these things God or to make of him a creation of space-time or a bud from the divinal imaginal is not to know him at all. He who errs about God does not know God. If any one believes God to be a body, he does not know God, but knows something else in the place of God. The confused knowledge of God affected by the use of first principles in the visible things of the world is no richer in its content than the foregoing. It will be recalled that the angelic doctor, in illustrating immediate religious experience, use the example of a man who, on seeing the order of the world, concluded some governor thereof. Later on, he adds, but who or what this governor of nature is, whether he be unique or not, 
we do not know immediately by confused knowledge. It is much like our concluding a soul as the cause of man's operations, when we see him moving and doing things. But what the soul is, whether it be a body, and how it affects its operations, we do not know. Dr. Tudor Jones, in this connection, writes, We have a certain knowledge of the doings of people, without ever having even formed logical contradictions concerning these doings. In the same way, the normal human mind has a certain idea that there must be, at the back of the universe, a reality corresponding in some way, at least, with what exists and happens in the world. The idea of God, in this sense, has been the possession of man at all times in the history of the race. All confused knowledge of whatever kind sins against this one point to wit. It can never clearly distinguish its object from other things. Though it is natural for us to know God by a confused knowledge, we cannot conclude that we know God as he is. Any more than when we know someone is coming over the hill in the distance, we can conclude that it is Peter, although it may be Peter who is coming. When therefore James says that from the point of view of religious experience, polytheism is as satisfying as monotheism, he is in the same accord with St. Thomas, who says that from confused knowledge, we do not know whether the governor of the world is one or many. But the mistake of James was to consider any further precision and determination of the confused notion by the intellect as something merely accidental. Make the intellectual element according and secondary, and they have religious experience opening the door to divinal imaginals and presidents of cosmic commonwealths. All such perversions in the doctrine of the nature of God find their way between the confused and the reflex or distinct knowledge. There need be no perversion of rudimentary knowledge of God, nor perversion of reflex knowledge. If it develops along the line of the first principles, the origin of the modern idea of God is thus a distortion of the elementary knowledge of God. Instead of elaborating the, ele the elementary knowledge of God by the use of intellectual principles, it perverts them. Make the confused knowledge ultimate and independent of intellectual analysis, and you pave the way to relativism, and atheism. The confused knowledge of God is only an undeveloped knowledge of God. The intellectual elaboration does for this confused knowledge what St. Paul did for the Athenians, one of whose altars he found inscribed to the unknown God. Both make known what men are worshipping without knowing it. Religious experience gives only the groundwork of knowledge. To say that the intelligence which determines this knowledge and defies it, and defines it, is secondary and accidental, is to say that which determines is subservient to that which is undeterminable. The potter that becomes the servant of his clay, and the sculptor of his marble, this is but another way of putting the principle which lies at the base of the whole philosophy of becoming. The part is greater than the whole. Such is the strange fortune of this form of relativism. Only a century ago, rationalism gloried in the, having liberated the intelligence from extrinsic control. Now it has denied the rights of reason entirely and falls down before the altar of sentiment. In pulling the meter from intellectual man, it has pulled the head off with it. We are no longer men, but animals. We feel our way instead of knowing it. While the intellectual must proceed the effective, there is a danger of confounding what is intellectual with intuition. 
in the modern sense of the term. This point has already been touched on in considering the intellect. Here it is reintroduced with some new contradictions. Intuition as a modern as a mode of knowledge has been contrasted with the intellect, which is said to distort reality. It is said to reveal life in its flow and before it takes the bend. But does not this theory of intuition offer serious difficulties which render it unacceptable? First of all, it seems illogical that a philo philosophical system which consists so much on unity and inveys against splitting up reality, should at the very outset juxtapose two modes of knowledge, namely intelligence and intuition. It immediately breaks up the unity of thought at the same moment that it cries out against its adversaries for so doing. It places in juxtaposition what should never be so placed, intuition and intelligence, if properly understood and not distorted, are not different. The intelligence may even be shown in a special sense to be an intuitive faculty. The more perfect the intelligence, the more perfect the intuition. The intuition of the human intelligence is meager when compared with an angel's as is an angel's when compared with God's. God's intelligence is pure intuition. Now the intimate vision of the nature of things, intus diger, does not by itself demand abstraction. It is merely by the accident of knowledge that the universe is abstracted from the particular. There is, too, a vicious circle in that the necessity of Burgossonian intuition must always be proved by reason, and the fallacious character of reason in turn by intuition. Otherwise, there would be only be confusion. How can we place ourselves in the moving currents of other objects, as M. Burgesson would have us do, by intuition? To know reality its concrete duration, must interpenetrate the being of the knower. There is, however, the possibility that when it comes to consciousness, it may get fused with his own duration in one blended whole. In that case, if we say that we know the object, we may either be drawing upon our own imagination or relying upon the intellect. If we draw upon imagination, we are all opening the floodgates to every form of mysticism, emotionalism, and sentimentalism. Then the only chance of agreement among different intuitions seems to be chance. If two people have the same vision, they may agree, but their experience will not be authoritative for the others. It is only if we make intuition intellectual that there is any chance of communicating our intuition to others. Summarizing briefly, we see that the fundamental difference between religious experience of the present day and that of the Philosophia Perinis is that the modern view there are only two elements, whereas in the scholastic system there are three. For the modern thinker, the first element is some effective state. The second element is the intellectual development of that experience, which is accidental and unnecessary. For the older philo philosophy, the first element is intellectual. It is either an implicit knowledge of God, indirectly based on the in inclinations of nature, or else an immediate knowledge by inference. Immediately upon this first element, which gives confused knowledge, there follows an effective state, which constitutes the second element. Finally, the intelligence again comes into play to make the implicit knowledge explicit and distinct in the literal metaphysical sense. These differences may be even more fundamentally analyzed. They pivot upon philosophies which are anti-intellectual and intellectual. 
All our differences are mere accidental. The battle must ultimately be fought between the followers of Aristotle, for whom the intelligence is divine, and the followers of James M. and M. Bergeson, for whom it is a beast and the original sin of thought. Knowledge of God is more than feeling or instinct. Intelligence at the helm is worth a whole cargo of instincts. It is not instinct that makes us religious. It is we who give religious significance and value to instinct, and this requires clear, honest, and strenuous thinking. If we would be religious, it is not enough to stand by while the waves of emotional energy breaks upon the shores of our souls. We must learn to launch the frail bark of an intelligent purpose on that stormy ocean, and by skill and insight make its boisterous energies convey us to the far and unknown shore of spiritual growth and discovery. It is worth observing that much of the modern doctrine of religious experience is founded on a confusion of the natural and the supernatural order. This, of course, modern philosophy does more or less wittingly. Professor Hornell has said, Modern philosophy of religion does not assume as its basis this distinction between revelation and reason. Hence, it does not attempt to prove it f- proof is the proper word, the existence of God without appeal to religious experience, and whilst appealing to this experience, and indeed regarding it as the only really relevant evidence, it also enlarges the scope of it far beyond revelation, so as to include, in effect, all that is valuable in the old appeal to reason. The confusion is the result of a long evolution of thought, which does not need more than a brief recall. The fundamental cause of the change of doctrine of our relation to God is a changed notion of human nature. Until the 15th century, human nature was considered perfectible by a gratuitous gift of God. Grace was not the destruction of nature. It was its perfection. From that time began a war against all extrinsic authority, either in the form of the church, as with Luther, or of the speculative intelligence, as with Kant, or of government, as with Rousseau. The biological hypothesis of evolution was taken over and was held by many to imply that for the perfectibility of human nature by a gift of God was substituted perfectibility through the natural law of progress and becoming. In other words, until the 15th century, nature and grace were regarded as superposed, one being the perfection of the other. Then came the new notion, one of juxtaposition, of nature and grace. A philosophy and a theology began in which nature was separated from grace, which was regarded as a sort of cloak thrown over corrupt nature. Descartes carried on the separation by making an inseparable distance between subject and object, and Kant between moral and objective knowledge, metaphysics and science. Such a juxtaposition which never should have been admitted, continued until biology offered the wearied philosophers an apparent solution, viz. the identification of what is juxtaposed. It is in that stage that we are now living. Evolution introduced flux into existence, and pantheism further introduced a flux in the conception of value. Nature and grace were fused into one, knower, and known, united in an ineffable intuition of becoming. God and the universe dissolved into an organic unity. Technically, this all means that the measure became itself a thing measured. Modern religious experience, modern gods, modern notions of religion are born of this 
identification of juxtaposed elements. Faith is no longer a gift of God, the perfection of the intellect, as the angelic doctor calls it. In the words of one of its modern exponents, it is neither a substitute for reason nor an addition to it. Faith is nothing more than reason grown courageous, reason raised to its highest power, expanded to its widest vision. We admit the state that there is progress and continuity in the universe. There is evolution, if there will, but continuity is not confusion. Continuity is possible only on condition that there be no confusion. Modern philosophy must be given credit for its happy reaction against a prior system, which were nothing more than mere fantasy or the wild upstart of some imaginal. For the latter, it has substituted a philosophy of religion, which is intimately intermingled with life and action, and in doing so has given both new meanings but it has erred by being too simple. It has taken a detail to explain the whole. Effective states and pragmatic judgments do very well as secondary considerations, but not as primary. An effective philosophy is necessary, relates, and contingent. It is private interpretation of God. It is a way of knowing which has never been adequately described, which is strictly incommunicable, which by some of its exponents has not been adequately known or felt. Perhaps a not irrelevant fact is that he who wrote most about it and is recognized as the spokesman of religious experience has never experienced it himself. We refer to William James, who said, I have no longer sense of commerce with God.